Thank you to everybody who voted in my recent poll. We received over a thousand votes in just over 24 hours. And while we already made the Gramatala ink deck, and I will revisit that later on, I wanted to follow through with the second most popular voted option in the Magic Broom deck, which is what you see on screen here, my deck list for a Ruby Amethyst version of the deck. The reason we're pairing it with Ruby is not because, you know, Ruby Amethyst is top tier and, you know, be prepared and whatnot, but simply because you have access to Jim Hawkins in Ruby and being able to play Jim Hawkins and then play the Sorcerer's Tower for free on turn five or six is pretty strong considering after you've played the Sorcerer's Tower for free, any brooms you've played prior to that can then move to the Sorcerer's Tower for free and then gain the additional lore when they quest. This interaction is still fairly strong, even though it's kind of niche. All you really need is Jim Hawkins and the Sorcerer's Tower in your hand because you'll likely draw into several different brooms along the way. Now, in addition to just playing the Sorcerer's Tower, we've also opted for two copies of RLS Legacy. It's a no-brainer to add a little bit more locations because you don't just want to limit your four copies of Jim Hawkins to drawing one of your four copies of any other location. You want to have a few other locations in there to synergize with the Jim Hawkins, and the RLS Legacy works very well since it's a big body, air quotes, for a location with eight toughness, but it also generates you two lore at the start of your turn. And for only costing four, it's actually not too bad. And you never know, that evasive ability might come in handy as well. We're going to go over the deck list and then we're going to take a look at two meta matches actually, like going up against meta decks, where this deck actually performed fairly well. I would mainly categorize this as a casual deck though, I would not try to be overly competitive with it um, because it does have some inherent weaknesses, like you could maybe beef this up by adding in like Merlin Rabbits and be prepared, but then it kind of takes away from the whole broom concept. Anyway, starting off we've got four Maleficent Biting Her Time and three Rafiki. These are also Sorcerer cards in addition to being decent one drops, which pair well with the Dancing Duster Broom card, the new thing that came out in Into the Inklands. Um, and I will go over that card when we get to it. Uh, but in the two drop slot, we've also got the Mad Mim Snake to bounce back your Maleficent after a quest to keep it safe and just recast it later on for an additional two lore pressure. And for Magic Broom Bucket Brigade, you play four Mad Mim Fox, four Magic Broom, I think that's the big sweeper. Yeah, that's the big sweeper one. Gets plus two strength while out of location, so it's essentially a 3-5 body for three, which is inkable. And you have uh, three Maleficent Sorceress, which again is another Sorcerer card. Four Merlin Goat, which is another Sorcerer, and of course four Mickey Mouse, um, Wayward Sorcerer, at the four drop slot. And I opted for no Merlin Rabbits, and you could make a case to put them in here because just you have limited card draw, which is crazy to say for Amethyst, but that's one of the weaknesses of the deck is that you do kind of lack card draw. That being said though, if you do establish your Mickey Mouse Wayward Sorcerer and it goes unanswered, your brooms are all coming back to your hand whenever they challenge things, which is very strong. Speaking of challenging, in the five drop slot, we're opting for all four of the new Magic Broom with Rush, the um, Magic Broom Swift Cleaner. Uh, this card, when it's played, will allow you to shuffle all of your brooms back into your deck, which technically means you can have an infinite loop of resources because as you put back your Bucket Brigades that are in your discard, if you redraw them, you can play Bucket Brigade and put back anything else that's not a Magic Broom. Uh, but of course, the game will end before you like loop infinite resources, obviously. Um, but it also quests for two or three if it's at the Sorcerer's Tower, which is nice. I've already explained the interaction with Jim Hawkins, and we've also opted for four Maui just for additional ways to deal with opponent's boards. Um, you can, again, make a case to play Be Prepared or Merlin Rabbits, but again, you don't want to go too high on the uninkable count. Being at 12 uninkables is nice because it means that you should have a lot of ink to play each turn. But like I said, you do struggle a little bit for card draw in this deck. We've only opted for two of the Magic Broom Dancing Duster. This card is fairly decent, but being uninkable does hurt it. And costing so much for only a 3-3 body does kind of hurt. Uh, and it only quests for one. So it is kind of underwhelming. But exerting a card is very powerful. And you play a number of sorcerers in the deck already, like we pointed out, in order to synergize with this card quite well. Four friends on the other side, no brainer there, and I've opted to include two Maui's Fish Hook. Even if you don't have a Maui on board, being able to beef up your Magic Broom cards for two cost, um, like recurably, or not recurably, <laughs> uh, consistently each turn, I should say, uh, is nice because let's say you beef up your Magic Broom, uh, the Big Sweeper, 
it's at a 3-5 body when it's out of location, it becomes a 6-5 body, it's basically a Maui now, and it can swing into something, and if you have Wayward Sorcerer on the field, that it goes back to your hand. So you're outing your opponent's resources, beefing up your characters, and likely getting those resources back if you have the Mickey Mouse on field as well. And then I've already explained the location. So we're at five minutes in the video, let's go ahead and uh, jump into some matches and you can see how the deck performs. So to start things off, we're going up against a Steel Amethyst deck. This color pairing is definitely going to be one of the strongest pairings in the game in the Into the Inklands meta. We are going second, which is unfortunate because we have a pretty good hand actually, um, and being on the play here would have mattered a lot because we have the aggro threats in the Maleficent. So the opponent starts off by inking a Robin Hood Champion of Sherwood, which is a very, very good card. I've already outlined this in my Market Watch video, which you can check out on my channel. Uh, they start off with a one-drop Maleficent, which is very interesting. You don't typically see this in the Steel Amethyst build, but it's a decent card to start off with because, I mean, <laughs> you know, lore isn't anything to uh, uh, shake your head at nowadays with uh, all the different ways that you can kind of close out a game very quickly, you know, <clears throat> Jafar. Anyways, the opponent starts off... Um, or secondly, dropping a Kida Bodyguard, which is very strong to protect their Maleficent. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ink the Rafiki, and after questing with my own Maleficent, drop the Snake. So you can kind of see how being on the draw here hurts me a little bit, because the opponent is now gonna go to five, and their Maleficent will indeed survive another turn, unless I draw a Mim Fox off the top, in which case I could crash my Snake into the Kida, and then Mim Fox it back to hand to take out the Maleficent. The opponent, dumps their whole hand basically on board here with a Diablo and another Maleficent to trigger the Diablo effect to scry, or not scry, but like look at the top two. Um, and then they ink another Robin Hood and I'm actually happy to see those going to the inkwell. So you can see like what I was talking about in my Market Watch video with why Robin Hood is so good. If they had a two drop Robin Hood on board, I can't quest with anything because if they drop, well I, I could, but if they drop that Robin Hood on shift, I just like lose advantage instantly, right? My card gets outed and they get two additional lore and then yeah, it's just a lot of pressure on board. So I have to play slow here. I'm opting for the card draw on turn three. Um, you know, I could have played, I guess, more Malefic replayed the Maleficent stuff, but it wasn't worth it. Um, the opponent drops a Queen's Castle and thinks hard here. And I'm like, I hope they don't quest. I hope they just opt to move everything to the Queen's Castle here, which would be great for me. Um, because, oh no, it would not be great for me right now. Yeah, that would not, because I'm not on Maui yet. So, yeah, that would be, if they opted not to quest with anything and just move everything to the Queen's Castle, I would be in trouble here because I wouldn't be able to take out the Queen's Castle and they would draw three. One of the nice things about them dumping their hand out was that they have minimal resources left. Uh, so they thought really hard there and I'm very thankful that they didn't move to the Queen's Castle. Uh, so now we're going to be able to take out their Maleficent with our own Maleficent three drop. And then I'm going to ink the broom and drop a goat just because I want more like strength on board in order to deal with the opponent's board because they are getting lore off that castle and they do potentially threaten drawing additional cards which could be a problem. Thankfully they're not drawing into a lot of ink here and that's really good for us. So you can see how they really do need that card draw. They really do need to move their cards to that queen's castle. Um, but the opponent is, you know, threatening 15 lore and then going to 17. So they're probably just thinking I'm going to close out the game very quickly. And I don't know if I revealed my second color yet. Oh no, I did because uh, never mind. The game tells you what it is, <laughs> of course. Um, but because we put Goat on board on turn four, on turn five we're able to drop Maui. And just like I was talking about prior to set three's release, when I was saying, you know, I was buying extra copies of Maui's for trade fodder. Maui showing its value here, being able to instantly out that location. And now the opponent is potentially in a difficult spot despite having such a huge lore advantage. They draw and pass, not doing anything, which indicates to me that they have a bunch of uninkables in hand. So we get some value off of our Maui by being able to sing friends on the other side. And now we're going to be able to drop the Jim Hawkins and the RLS Legacy and continue to uh, you know, develop our board here. Quest with the Maleficent and the Goat and go to five. And now we're threatening big lore because we have the location that's generating two, the Jim Hawkins that's uh, going to also quest for two, and then Goat and Maleficent. Okay, the opponent reveals one they're uninkable here in the Grab Your Swords, which wipes out uh, half my board, unfortunately. Uh, but again, the location is protected, which is nice. Uh, the opponent is thinking what to do here, and I think they eventually end up crashing their goat into the Maui. In my opinion, not the play I would have made, um, but I understand if they want to just get the Maui off the board. Uh, they end up questing, going up to 15, and a passing turn. So I'm thinking they have another Grab Your Swords in hand, 
based on how they played. And so you're going to see me um, sing friends, drop a Mickey Mouse, play a broom for one, and I could play and put back the uh, the friends. I could play out the Maleficent here, but because I'm thinking they have another grab your swords, I'm like, let me just pass turn because if they wipe my board except for the Mickey Mouse, I do want to play this Maleficent as follow up. As expected, I made the correct read and were, was able to um, preserve my Maleficent. I did make a misplay though, because on the last ink, I think I could have moved something to the RLS Legacy, but at least we drew into a Sorcerer's Tower. Now it doesn't generate passive lore, but if we do draw into any brooms, it will instantly threaten a lot of lore. Um, the opponent ends up hardcasting a whole new world here, and I'm like, okay, this is game, I think, because I'll generate two from RLS, and the Mickey Mouse and Jim Hawkins and Maleficent will close out the game from there. In this next matchup, we are going up against an Emerald Amber Discard deck, and once again, going second, which again is really unfortunate because being uh, more of an aggro deck, um, like an aggro mid rangey kind of deck, you do definitely want to be on the play with, with these kind of decks. Um, and I mean, I guess it's, it's good that they're not on steel because our, our, you know, aggro questers don't get pinged out by something like, uh, a Cinderella turn one, turn two, sing any three cost song. Um, but we're going to see how this board state will develop. Um, the, I'm trying to think like, what kind of songs are they really going to sing here? And then I realized later on, like, oh yeah, they're probably on a discard deck because like sudden chill and whatnot are going to be pretty good to sing with either Ursula or the Cinderella. So they got dual utility singers here. So they strike uh, a good match, draw two, Inca strike a good match, and play a Flynn Rider, and I'm like, okay. Uh, the best strategy I've found for playing against Discard is just trying to establish and develop a decent sized board, and then just dump your hand out so they don't get any advantage off of Prince John. And then you can run into like the Mirror Folks and the Flynn Riders, etc., and not have to worry about discarding. So those cards become essentially just questing tools. And once you out them, they're no longer a threat because they don't trade positively um, because there's nothing for them to discard in your hand. So the opponent's on three cards. Uh, they do have, you know, questing pressure on board and they do have the Prince John, which will draw them cards. So we're going to discard the Maleficent that we bounce back to our hand. The opponent, unfortunately, will be able to draw off this Prince John here, and then they pass turn. So we, drew, we draw friends. We're going to ink one of our Sorcerer's Tower, and I'm going to have to crash this uh, Fox into the Cinderella. Uh, okay, no, never mind. I'm going to quest with it and then bounce, the, bounce it with Fox. Yeah, and then use Fox to take out the Cinderella uh, because we're not going to crash into the Flynn yet. We're finally letting the opponent quest up. Uh, and we're likely going to take out the Flynn Rider once we have no hand, which sounds crazy, um, but uh, it, it'll work, trust me. So they quest for two, go back up to four now, um, and we're going to ink the uh, snake that we bounce back to hand and throw down a Mickey Mouse. And this is important because Mickey Mouse is a card that can generate me enough advantage um, that I can banish the brooms on my turn, and get them back to my hand and then recast them so the opponent doesn't have a chance to discard them. Unfortunately, they play Bare Necessities and this card is absolutely ridiculous. Singing it with Ursula here gets them two discards and off Prince John now, they get to draw two. So again, discard can seem so demoralizing. The opponent now has a tremendous advantage over me, it looks like, right? Because they have um, four cards in hand, four cards on board versus my two on board and two in hand. And yes, it does look like a dire situation. Um, but I guess for some reason, I, must, I don't know if they misclicked there, or, or they ad actually might have legitimately not have any characters off of that BR gas, which would be crazy. Um, but we're going to be able to ink and then play double broom. So we end up dumping our whole hand, and the Bucket Brigade puts back the Sorcerer's Tower that we ended up discarding with the Bare Necessities. And then Fox is going to take out the Flynn now that we have no hand, and the Brush Broom is going to take out the Ursula. Uh, now the opponent is left with two cards on board, Yes, the Merfolk will quest for two, but it won't get any value off of discarding anything in my hand. But we do have to worry about those cards in the opponent hand. Now, keep in mind, they're only still on three ink, and we have five ink. So we're actually not that far behind. Uh, and the fact that we have the Mickey Mouse here is actually pretty strong to recycle our brooms. Um, the only problem is the opponent doesn't have uh, anything that I can crash into that will take out my broom. So we draw to a Rafiki and we drop it here and then Fox is going to take out the Mirror Folk and then we're just going to quest for two more. Um, or sorry, three because the the yeah the Rush Broom take uh, quest for two. It would be really nice if I had the location up, right? The opponent does Mother Knows Best though on the Mickey and then quest with the Daisy which forces me to discard the Mickey. So pretty nice play on the opponent's end there. Um, but again, they're not really going to cast anything else this turn since 
they've used up their ink to play the Mother Knows Best. They opt to crash their Prince John here because I guess they realize like the opponent's going to constantly have no cards in hand, so my John isn't really going to get any advantage. We take out the Daisy Duck because, um, of course, we draw the, the Dancing Duster when we don't have enough ink to play it. The one, one of the only cards, like, yeah, literally this card, like the two copies of this card are the only cards I could have drawn right now that I can't play um, or ink um, against a discard deck. So it is what it is. Um, the opponent is going to part of your world here, and this card is going to get back the Ursula Singer. They're going to drop a Cinderella and pass turn. So we're going to get a Maui's Fish Hook, and I'm like, I don't need strength or evasive in this uh, um, deck, or in this matchup, sorry, right now. So I'm going to go ahead and exert the Cinderella, crash the broom into it, and quest with the Rafiki. Because, again, Rafiki is a sorcerer, so it procs the um, Dancing Duster there. So again, just like I talked about in the deck list, it's why playing that one drop Rafiki can be important, because on the surface, it seems like not a great card, being a 0-2 when it's exerted. Um, but we draw a pretty good draw here, actually, in the one drop Maleficent. Because again, the opponent's not on, like, grab your swords or anything. So we're able to just continue to quest here. And now I'm threatening game. Uh, the opponent has to take out one of my threats. Um, so they have to crash their Ursula, most likely into... No, it doesn't... Yeah, it takes out the Rafiki here. But then, unless they establish two more characters that can deal with what I have on board, um, I'll still quest to 19. And then I can top deck like a goat or a location, like an RLS Legacy or any character, and the opponent will likely not be able to win the game fast enough before my last rated character that I top deck will win the game for me. Um, so yeah, the uh, part of your world singing with Ursula there is a really nice interaction to get back two characters. Uh, they drop the Mirror Folk, and there's nothing else that they can really do at this point. Um, so yeah, they had to crash the Ursula, but I think they were, I don't know what they were fishing for, but maybe they thought the Ursula wouldn't be enough, given what they have in their hand. Uh, yeah, so their card casting strike a good match. I don't know what they could be looking for here. The give me the well played, knowing that the game is over, we top deck a Jim Hawkins and we just quest for game. So that was the deck and gameplay. Let me know what you think. If you enjoyed the broom deck, thank you again for watching. Quantum is out.